I'm going to be very candid with you. We are living in a computer program. Reality. Welcome, everyone, to Simulation Nation, your portal to all things yeah. virtual. I'm your host, Johnny Android, and I'm here to keep you informed about all that's happening in the metaverse. We record our episodes live in Allspace every week, and you can join us from your PC or VR headset. Usually, just log into Allspace, join our Simulation Nation channel, and teleport in to offer your opinion, question, or whatever else. Today, we have our most venerated guest. If you're a fan of Deadpool, Terminator Dark Fate, District 9, Elysium, Handmaid's Tale, Love, Death, and Robots, and a bunch of other modern-day classics, and chances are you've loved the work of Jules. Nominated for an Oscar for editing District 9, Jules has had an epic career by any metric, but particularly for sci-fi lovers. Ladies and gentlemen, give a warm emoji welcome for Jules. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Johnny. You're welcome. It's so good to have you. So uh, we should say, um, you know, we'd had a little technical difficulty. Jules has been uh, texting me all day saying, shouldn't we have a tech scout for this? Shouldn't I make sure that the virtual reality is going to work for me? And of course, I was like, nah, we'll just wing it. And then what happens is um, the mic didn't work and this didn't work. And so we had to we had to not do the VR portion of today's show. It's just going to be audio. I was going to doing the, the, the Castle Wolfenstein version where you're uh, just logged in in sort of low res first person shooter. But uh, yeah, it didn't work. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, I was so excited to give you your first experience in uh, at least one of the sort of metaverses, although this is the first interview and episode we've done since. Uh, Zuckerberg appropriated the name, stole the name Meta. He's now changed Facebook to Meta. And now we have to come up with a new term for Metaverse because he can't just like steal that and, and sort of own it. That's not right. So now we got to come up with a new name. Um, any off the top of your head, Jules? What? For, oh, God. <laughs> Virtual verse. Um, uh, uh, multiverse, maybe. Um, I don't know what that we're going to one's taken. Yeah. I don't know what we're going to call it, but we can't do, do metaverse anymore. In any case, we what, what, is, what does William Gibson call it? Uh, well, he called it cyberspace. <laughs> right? I don't know. Yeah. That doesn't, that doesn't feel good anymore. Does it? Yeah. That cut, doesn't cut it anymore. And, uh, Neil Stevenson, of course, coined the term metaverse back in 92 with snow crash. We're doing an episode in a couple of weeks on, on snow crash. Um, but yeah, we'll have to figure out something else. In any case, um, you were going to join us in 2d, we would be in VR and we were going to have this event in all space. Uh, and we were going to at least show you what it was like. You got a little glimpse. What was your first impressions? It's a little different in 2d. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, I guess it's kind of cool that, you know, uh, you're there, but you can kind of, you're also kind of like, you have a kind of mask on as it were. So it's sort of like a masquerade ball or something like that. Right. There's a degree of anonymity and the freedom that comes with that, but then you're also there and kind of interacting. So, uh, it's a cool idea. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah. People can reinvent themselves and, you know, people who are trapped in their homes or have an illness or have, uh, you know, whatever the case may be, they can reinvent themselves and be someone different. You know, we've met people who are too, they have a, a, a you know, shyness in real life. They're so painfully shy and they can go in and because they're wearing a mask in their avatar form, they can express themselves freely and be open and all that stuff. So yeah, there's a lot of really interesting facets to it. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll get you in next time. We'll get you in next time. Right. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, uh, so on to the, uh, onto the, the main portion of the show, the first sort of thing we like to talk about is the origin story. So how this, uh, giant of the sci-fi, uh, genre, uh, has arrived, uh, where we did. So, um, let me just show you here, uh, the slide of the origin story. So, um, why don't you tell us, uh, how you got started and, um, you know, where, how did you, how did you get in, in involved in such an incredible career? Let's just start there. Um, well, I mean, I, you know, I, I didn't, I was not one of those people who was kind of like born thinking I wanted to be a filmmaker or anything like that. You know, my parents had kind of, my dad was a scientist, my mom was a novelist. So I just knew I wanted to do something cool that did not approximate having a real job. So <laughs> I got into university and I just kind of started taking a lot of courses and then film courses were of course, like by far the most fun and kind of uh, coolest. So I was just like, oh yeah, obviously I'm going to do this. Um, 
And so I should say, we should say that I, you know, Johnny Android and from Earth AI two dimension. However, uh, I, our, our, our dimensions very much intersect and we met each other back then and we're in film school together back in the day That's uh, yeah. up in Vancouver. That's right. That's right. And, and so uh, I just remember you did back then, you did a, a Kafka short, I believe. Yes, yes, yeah. I mean, everyone has to make a pretentious black and white short film at some point. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, and yeah. So, I mean, I, I had a good time making that and I learned a hell of a lot. And one of the things I've learned is much like editing a lot more than directing. Right. I mean, uh, of course, directing is, you know, fabulous in terms of like, you know, uh, you're, you get to be the sort of so-called author of the movie and get to dabble in all these different art forms. But there's a lot about directing that was kind of a drag to me. You know, there's so much compromise involved in directing, especially when you're doing low budget directing. You know, you have limited time, you have limited money. You know, you you're trying to get actors to say your words a certain way, but they're maybe coming out wrong. You're not the person operating the camera. Usually you're not the person doing a lot of the stuff. You're kind of just delegating to all these different people and maybe they have their own ideas. And so the whole thing kind of just feels a little bit out of control when you're shooting it. And of course, there's some people who are very good at controlling that chaos and sort of riding the wave, as it were. But I kind of felt like, oh, once we got into the editing process, it was like, oh, this is suddenly the process is back under control again. I kind of like this. Right. And uh, and there's very few jobs in filmmaking. You know, I think probably editing, writing and film composing where you can be kind of one person and just kind of have this dramatic impact on shaping the movie and creating the movie and not needing this kind of military operation to kind of make it happen. Right. And yeah, so so that was like kind of like, oh, that was the thing that was for me. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I agree. The way I word it is that it's like in, in, in production, you deal so much with politics and it just takes you away from the creative process. I have I, over time gravitated more towards writing because it's a purely creative act. And it sounds like you're the same, but I would say for you, it's like for editing, it's like a purely creative act, but also a technical act. If I remember, you were the first person to have an Apple G4 That's back right. in the day. I mean, so I'm the first person in the world, but probably <laughs> in your social group, yes. Yeah, no, yeah, and and you were like, I just, I just remember you back then, like, you know, in, you know, '90s style clothes, smoking cigarettes on your G4, you know, locked into editing something that, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I think you know uh, that you know the the confluence of sort of technology at that moment played a role as well, because prior, you know, I kind of you know graduated film school right around the point that Final Cut Pro 1.0 came out. And so before that point, you needed kind of like these $30,000 kind of hardware packages to be able to have like an editing system. And so it was just really not attainable for your average person. And then so once Final Cut Pro came out and you could run it on these, you know, these, uh, these sort of, you know, consumer good consumer Mac computers, suddenly all this was accessible. And so this, I could just essentially buy this stuff and go, Hey, I'm an editor as opposed to kind of needing to like intern somewhere just to get access to the equipment. Right. And so that kind of, I think that opened up a whole, uh, it opened up the sort of editing job to a whole kind of generation of people before that you really needed to be like an assistant editor for a working editor and kind of almost be the sort of apprentice and hope that you got an opportunity to kind of be like brought up. And then, you know, the combination of digital photography where people were shooting a lot of low budget movies with this now affordable editing equipment, suddenly, you know, uh, suddenly you could kind of just do it. And now, of course, like with YouTube and all that now, like everyone's literally an editor, like children know how to edit. And so uh, you really have to be, you know, uh, separate yourself from the back in a way that like maybe you didn't have to like a couple decades ago. Right. Yeah. But, but, you know, I, I have other, I know other people who were extremely talented editors, had a great, you know, film school at American Film uh, Institute or whatever, and then became assistant editors for a really long time. So after you went to, to film school and went into the indie world, how is it that you were able to find work and get going? Because you didn't go that route where you became an assistant. Yeah. Well, I think there it's two totally viable routes, right? So yeah, the route I took was, you know, I graduated film school and then I just started like editing people's short films. So like at first it was like all the people I went to film school with, they would make a short film, I would edit it, you know, then it would be like, you know, people that 
you know, knew those people and I would edit their things. And then, you know, Van- basically, you know, I was in Vancouver at this time. And so basically I just became the guy who was editing all the short films in Vancouver for a certain period of time. I mean, there was a couple of us, but like, you know, I was pretty like well known within that kind of world. And I made very, very, very little money doing that. But like, I kind of, you know, planted seeds everywhere. And after kind of, you know, two or so years of doing that, eventually some of those people making short films were making features and I was working on those features. And then I was kind of making like, you know, a living at it, not like a good living, but you know, I could, I could pay my rent and whatnot and kind of treat it like a job. Um, and just sort of doing that for, you know, years that kind of just naturally flowed into kind of, okay, now I'm doing a documentary. Now I'm doing some reality TV. Now I did a direct to video animated Barbie movie. Like I literally was this sort of like Jack of all trades kind of person. And that's kind of the career you need to have when you're not in Los Angeles, because, you know, Los Angeles has this, like a lot of very high quality kind of work happening. And so you can kind of go like, I just do this kind of thing, you know, this high quality thing, or I do action movies or I do comedies. If you're doing this in like Canada or whatever, you can't like go like specialize in one type of thing. You're just kind of like, uh, what's available right now. Okay. I'll do that. Right. So so, but in a way that was a great training ground because I kind of had, you know, I had edited some horror, I'd edited some drama, I'd edited some comedy, I'd edited some documentaries. So I was like, I had a very kind of like wide palette that I could felt comfortable working on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if you were to name one movie that was like the craziest <laughs> movie that you worked on back then, are any of those known by the way, or are they all just like, uh, <laughs> Like, are they, well, like, I mean, I, I mean, some are, there's one that's, I guess, sort of notorious or whatever. <laughs> which one's that? Uh, the, I worked on an Uva Bowl movie, you know, the worst director in the world or whatever, yeah. or whatever, quote unquote. Uh, um, so, uh, yeah, so I worked on a movie called Postal, which I like to think is one of the better Uva Bowl movies, uh, you know, and which has like, you know, uh, you know, all sorts of offensive humor about, you know, the war on terror and all sorts of stuff like that. That was like really designed to push people's buttons. You know, he definitely watched team America world police a couple of times and was like trying to do that kind of thing in the live action world. Uh, I had a good time working on it. And of course, you know, uh, you know, people, <laughs> some people like that movie and others really don't. <laughs> yeah. 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 Crazy. Okay. And so for, at this point you're thinking, I'm just going to be uh, an editor in Vancouver. I'm going to make a living doing what I love to do. Did you have aspirations to do anything else other than that? Or, or what was your plan at that point? Well, I mean, I think I, of course I aspired to kind of work on, you know, uh, bigger, exciting stuff that people would see or whatever. I mean, you don't get into this and just kind of go like, I want to work on stuff that, you know, not people aren't watching. Right. But, you know, you just kind of work on what you can get your hands on. Right. And and I didn't have a I'm going to move to Hollywood and take over kind of plan. So, yeah. So I was just kind of like, you know, just trying to find work that I like doing and, you know, one job after another. And this, you know, and uh, I, you know, I was I think I worked really hard and people liked working with me. So so kind of I think a kind of a confluence of just being a kind of person who because of hard work and being a kind of a nice person was kind of getting, you know, the kind of person that people would recommend a job for when this sort of totally uh, lightning strike opportunity of working on district nine happened, you know, that was definitely something that was like very, very, very lucky and unusual to have as an opportunity or as a Vancouver film editor. But I guess the part of it that I created was just like having this like, you know, history of like just, hard work and like people kind of, kind of, you know, getting on with me. So like that, if they would hear an opportunity like that, they would go like, Oh yeah, this guy, you should talk to him. And that's exactly what happened. Right. Someone kind of suggested me for that job and then I got it and then kind of transformed my whole career. Right. Okay. So I I gotta, you know, it would be so interesting to know, like, so you, you, you're someone, you know, calls you in for this job district nine and you meet with the director. Is that who you met with? And how is that? What was that meeting like? You know, I think we just talked on the phone because I think he was like, you know, maybe in like New Zealand or something like that at that point, you know, Uh, so so we talked on the phone a couple times. I mean, we yeah, so we had a a mutual friend, basically, Clinton Shorter, who has ended up being the composer on District 9. So Clinton had like done music on a whole bunch of uh, stuff I'd worked on. And we kind of, you know, we just really liked each other's stuff and we liked each other as people. So like, you know, when 
uh, you know, uh, I was working on something. I'd be like, oh, you should hire this guy. He's really good. He'll do a great job or whatever. And like, so he was doing the same thing. So this was just kind of like one of those things where like, you know, he was friends with Neil and Neil was like, uh, uh, you know, a, a commercial director at that time, mostly. And so he didn't have like a, you know, a feature editor relationship. And so we kind of asked his social group, Hey, you know, you know, anyone and Clinton put forward my name now in normal circumstances that would have not, not been nearly enough to get someone, you know, like me hired on that project because, you know, a lot of kind of studio projects, they want like real A-list proven people. And that was just not, I think for two reasons that was sort of, you know, didn't happen this movie. One, you know, even though it was like $35 million or whatever, you know, the budget ended up being, most of that was going into visual effects. And so the way that they had kind of like, you know, budgeted kind of like the key crew positions, they were not paying like the sort of like high, high rates that you would expect on like a sort of like, on like a big studio movie. So it would have been kind of a hard sell to get like a kind of really fancy A-list editor on it for the amount of money maybe. and. Also, uh, Peter Jackson was kind of the producer on that. And though even Sony was the studio, Peter Jackson was really the source of power on that movie. And Peter Jackson was, you know, I don't think Peter Jackson really sees himself as a Hollywood person either, right? You know, mm -hmm. he's kind of like in New Zealand and doesn't really want to deal with the studios either, I think. And so he was kind of very supportive of Neil, like kind of letting Neil hire who he wanted to hire. So Neil hired me. He hired his friend, Trent Opalock, who was, a, you know, basically a kind of, I think he, Trent had done like mostly commercials at that point in Canada uh, to be the DOP. Clinton Shorter, you know, had done some like, you know, Canadian TV and stuff like that. You know, we were all kind of of similar kind of pedigree, like not like, you know, had been working for, you know, a, you know, a certain number of years, but like not really on Hollywood's radar. And then uh, Charlotte Car Copley, you know, you know, uh, you know, cast as Vickis, the main character who like, you know, he had acted in like short films and stuff mm. like that, but he was like a bit more like a producer in South Africa, not like an actor. Mm. So it was really like very unusual how like these people who are like not kind of, kind of like known quantities in Hollywood were allowed into these like key positions on that movie. Uh, and then of course, like we all went on to have like crazy Hollywood careers as a result, like Trent Opalock shot Avengers Endgame. Like that shows wow. you fucking the, 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 the trajectory there. Wow. Right? So, uh, so yeah, so it was like a transformative for, for all of us, uh, you know, working on that movie. Yeah. So yeah, it was a crazy unique opportunity. And of course, you know, you have to not fuck up the opportunity, uh, which we didn't, right. uh, but, uh, but yeah, you know. Yeah, I guess it, it does have that sort of raw um, sort of feel to it that it's trying to not be polished deliberately. It's trying to be this sort of found footage type docu style thing. And so a little rough around the edges sort of fits that kind of vibe. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty, pretty amazing. Isn't it? Um, so I guess you got to give us a Peter Jackson story. <laughs> <laughs> How was he on the production? Did you did you have much interaction with them or or what? You know what? Yeah, I mean, like they were in the middle, I think, of making the lovely bones at that point. You know, so it wasn't like a kind of thing where you'd see Peter Jackson every day or something like that. He would come in, you know, for certain key points, you know, like when we were kind of like getting ready to lock or when we were like getting ready for reshoots or something like that. And then he would be kind of like intensely involved for like a week or something like that. But then, you know, those weeks, you know, big stuff would happen in those weeks or whatever. Wow. Um as far as like a story, you know, um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of a good one here. Um, well, you know, uh, one thing that happened, you know, we were originally, you know, kind of, you know, we're editing in Vancouver for a little bit in the beginning. And then they were like, you know, we think, you know, we should come over to New Zealand, you know, for a week or two to like, you know, talk, you know, meet with Peter and blah, blah, blah. And mind melds. We're like, okay. And so like, uh, so we came over there for like, uh, a week or two and uh and then he's like maybe you should stay another week i was like okay i guess we'll stay another week whatever and then it's like maybe you should stay another week maybe you should stay another week anyway basically we were there for like three or four months it was supposed wow. to be a two-week meeting and it ended up being three or four months and you know a lot of this time i haven't seen like peter jackson at all and then like i think you know sort of towards the end i kind of like you know i sit down in a meeting and he's you're still here it's like, <laughs> like, yes i'm still here <laughs> nice that's crazy. So I guess the only other thing about District 9 that I'm curious about is, um, you know, where you hadn't done that many visual effects 
up to that point. So how did you find that aspect of it? Was there a whole team that they bring on that are the visual effects experts or how is the editor involved in the effects process? You know, it was, you know, that one as your, as you know, I had done some visual effects stuff, but yes, it was like, it was absolutely minimal compared to that. Um, and, uh, that was a really funny one to have as your, as your first one, because right. normally you have this big infrastructure, you know, on these movies where you have like, you know, a pre department where they'll be like, okay, we're going to put in, you know, this kind of video game, you know, animatic version of this thing in there. So you know what you're doing. And, you know, you have like a visual effects editor who's always updating your shots and like letting you know what's happening and stuff like that. We had, None of that, you know, it was like me and an assistant editor and that's it. And normally, you know, that would be like a team of maybe like, you know, you'd have like six or seven or eight people or something filling out like how this would be or whatever. Right. So it was like, uh, so I, I, so I thought that's how you made these movies. But then, when I, then when I, when I did it on other ones, I was like, oh, they do it an entirely different way. So we were, it was, it was this sort of thing we were making this, you know, like, I think we had seven or 800 shots in that movie and, but we were making it like we were almost making an independent film or something, you know? Uh, but in to answer your other sort of part of the question about like the process for editing it, you know, um, certain parts of it were, you know, sort of fairly straightforward, like, you know, the editing, the stuff with, uh, with the aliens was mostly straightforward because we, we did a kind of, I guess what you call a process of, uh, rotomation so we had a kind of an actor there performing the aliens you know across some thickest and they would kind of like you know a lot of improv was in the movie so they would kind of improv improvise back and forth and uh, of course then eventually we totally replaced the aliens improv with like you know the the alien language and subtitles and stuff like that but i had something there to edit with and a sort of spatial reference for like the aliens here this is the eye line you know, so that, you know, and an emotional kind of performance to kind of use as a sort of basis of something to cut with. Uh, what got really tricky is when we got into the sort of third act action stuff. This is where kind of normally you, you would use previs or something like that. Um, but I think, you know, previs is quite costly. So we did, we kind of opted to not do that because this was kind of, you know, we were, you know, uh, trying to be a little thrifty on this movie. Right. Um, and uh, so, yeah, the stuff with the exosuit they would just kind of like, you know, have these empty shots where you go, the exit suits in there. And then every, you know, once in a while, a guy would run in with a big stick to let you go, it's this tall. <laughs> and then they would, then the stick guy would leave. And so it's very hard to like cut an action sequence where you just have like tons of empty shots. Right. right. And, and you wouldn't like, like, how long do you make the empty shot? You know, like, is it two seconds, three seconds, four seconds? Like how long does it take the thing that's not there to do the thing? Right. So you have to kind of just, sort of imagine it, or I would get like, you know, what you call like a turntable of the model where they like have just like kind of a still frame of the model rotated. And I would, you know, I just kind of like make a freeze frame and I would just plop it in like a bad, you know, Photoshop file. And I would just kind of animate it like, you know, getting bigger or smaller wow, or something crazy. like that, or like flop it when it's like turning to run away or something, you know, like just like the, you know, like worse than Monty Python flying right. circus style animation, just to get some like notion of like, this is sort of what it's doing or whatever, and try to get some idea of, you know, how to cut it. Um, so, so that part was, you know, uh, pretty challenging and it was intimidating too, because like these shots, you know, would be like, oh, this shot's going to cross like, 60 grand or 70 grand just to do this like four second piece. And so, you know, like two of those shots is going to like, you know, equal my salary for like working on the movie or something like that. Right. So, so you feel like this immense pressure to like not waste this money. Right. Is it like, if you, if you choose a shot that like, you know, is bad or not needed, then like, it's like all this, like, you know, huge amount of money, like, you know, on the floor. Uh, so, so yeah, that sort of, it was kind of, uh, it was kind of intense. Wow. Crazy. Well, obviously you did an in incredible job. So the movie comes out, it does really well. And then you get nominated for an Oscar. Tell us about that. How was that like experience and what, were, what was going to your mind at that moment? I mean, it was quite terrifying to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like uh, you don't get into editing to be like, yeah, I want to like go up and like receive, <laughs> give a sp televised speech. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, you know, kind of going from like being like little editor of independent films to suddenly like, boom, you've worked on this thing that's like made $300 million and you're Oscar nominated. It was like pretty, 
you know, overwhelming. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, of course, like it opened lots of doors for me and, you know, gave me a Hollywood career. So I'm very grateful for to it. But yeah, it was like definitely, I wasn't like a thing where I was like, super just happy about it. It was just definitely like, whoa, I feel like very overloaded by this, you know, like. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> totally. Well, crazy. Well, I, I hope you, you know, you appreciated it in the moment a little bit because that, as you probably know, that's, you know, sometimes it's just like lightning in a bottle and then, you know. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm quite, yeah. I peaked early. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. 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 I, I doubt that. Let's go into the rest. I can't even go over all of your careers. There's so many insanely awesome things. So I've chosen a few. Oh, sure. Jump to Elysium really quickly, uh, which was your next Neil Blancom movie. So I think this one is, is, is pretty in, in the sense that you had already worked with the director, you'd established a rapport. Obviously, you did incredibly uh, well and successful the first one. So uh, how long was it before you did Elysium? And uh, what was that process like? And I guess you had more budget. You weren't under the radar anymore. How did that go? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I was, I mean, I guess I would say I was less under the radar. But, you know, like, I'm, I'm still like... Uh, I, I still don't really feel like there's a certain, you know, number of, you know, editors who've like been in this LA for a long time and they're kind of on like the speed dial of the various, like, you know, studio people. And, you know, I lived it still, even when I had sort of, you know, became a Hollywood person, I lived in Vancouver as a sort of place where I was, you know, keeping my home base for a long time. So I never really felt like I kind of was like, I always sort of still felt like a bit of a dark horse in Hollywood, even after I, had some success there or whatever, you know? Um, but yes, I was not like a coming in out of, out of it from like pure obscurity. So, uh, so the, yeah. And you know, it was, or it was, I think like three or four years, uh, after, uh, district nine, um, you know, kind of took a little bit of time getting going. Um, and, uh, you know, one, here's, here's one, you know, little side thing for you that you might, uh, uh, might like since we're, you know, since you're all about the metaverse. That's right. The, uh, the original uh, concept for Elysium, we didn't shoot this, obviously, is that Elysium was actually going to be uh, not an orbital platform, but essentially like a metaverse. So essentially like it was a, a utopia in sort of like, you know, a kind of that you could enter in your mind or whatever. Oh, right? interesting. Uh, so it was supposed to be like kind of like a, an inverse matrix where the world is so shitty that you want to break into the utopia of Elysium in your mind or whatever. Like ready player one or something. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. So yeah. So that, that kind of notion, except one where it was like fully, uh, you know, fully immersive to the point where you couldn't tell the difference between, you know, uh, it being, you know, uh, it, you know, it being reality or not. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course, you know, I think they came to the right decision that probably for dramatic purposes, you know, the having a kind of orbital platform around Earth kind of was a, 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 a sort of a better thing for dramatic purposes and easier to dramatize. You know, uh, I think we look at, you know, that simulated experience in a kind of negative way. So the idea that people would want that simulated experience over real life, you know, that's maybe like a harder sell than kind of going like, I want to go to this actual paradise that's like up there or whatever, or something like that. That's a sort of easier idea to kind of buy into. Right. Uh, At least before uh, Westworld se uh, episode, uh, season three and all the movies that are coming out now, I think back in 2013 or 2012, when you were doing this, then for sure, that was, that was the case. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's funny, you know, another thing that's kind of prescient about the movie is like, you know, obviously it's, uh, you know, all about this sort of, you know, border security, illegal immigration and income inequality. And those like issues now are like 10 times more like potent and in the kind of news media than when we kind of made that movie. Right. So, uh, you know, so, uh, yeah. So in, in a way, I think that a lot of the sort of themes in that movie are kind of actually uh, kind of ahead of their time. Right. It's a more re it's kind of more relevant now. I mean, like it's, you know, we made it whatever for 10 years before Trump's wall. Right. Right. Um, right. Crazy. And so you were still in Vancouver at that time. And then, um, you were just editing up there still, or you were coming down here for, yeah, we, I mean, I mean, uh, Neil lives in Vancouver too. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, a, a big part of being able to make it happen in Vancouver was Neil and the fact that Neil lived there. And so when I did his movies, I could kind of, I could kind of treat that as, as our home base. Now I did also go on location to like Mexico city for it. And so there was a bit of travel on that side of it. Um, but yeah, it's the non Neil side of it. All those people, they don't live in Vancouver. And so 
they've uh, they've eventually pulled me into the uh, the the gravity of Los Angeles. So. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay, so before we get down to the next one, which is a little more uh, humor centric, comic centric, which I'm I'm curious about in, in your editing there. I feel like Elysium is is and some of the other stuff you're doing is is really dramatic and. You know, the writer and the director certainly have a role uh, in creating that sense of emotional storytelling, but I feel like the triumvirate is the editor as well. So how do you go about, do you edit with emotion in mind? Do you try to create the emotional story through the performances or in pacing? We're getting a little into the weeds here, but tell us your secrets, Jules. <laughs> I don't know. That's a very, that's a very uh, elliptical question there. Um, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, of course, yeah. I mean, editing is all about emotion or whatever, right? I mean, it's all, you, I mean, when you're editing close-ups, it's all about like staring into the actor's eyes and like what the, these little micro things, like when they blink and when they, when they, do, you know, just do these tiny little, you know, uh, micro adjustments on their faces, which you go, Oh, this makes us make me feel this. And so there is like, yeah, there is a sort of a, you have to have some sort of crazy little uh, emotional intelligence where you're kind of zeroing in on this kind of like these little details of human emotion and shaping that um, because good actors will give you a whole bunch of that kind of stuff to play with. And, you know, so you can create a lot of different emotions and tones and stuff like that. You can, and sometimes, you know, like sometimes making it big is bad and you have to dial it back and go, okay, you know, uh, so uh, that's definitely a huge part of it. And I, I don't know. I just spend a lot of time thinking about, I guess, tone as well. I just kind of like, it's hard to describe tone, but there's just kind of like a, a feeling that the movie has when you read the script and when you watch dailies, you just kind of, it just, it, it kind of exudes something to you. And then you go, okay, like this feeling I'm getting from this, I, I now I'm going to try to manifest this into a scene, mm -hmm. you know? And like, and you go, okay, and I think the music kind of sounds like this. And then I'll go through all like my collections of soundtracks and I'll like find, you know, okay, yes, yes, this fits. And then sometimes that will like, you know, give you more ideas for like how to kind of shape something or whatever, you know, like mm. definitely music is a big part of my process for sure. Mm. Um, and you show, so, the, so, you know, your director, you'll show their temp track too, and then they'll be like, oh yeah, we got to get the rights to this now, or they'll show well, that. Well, not the rights, but yes, but I mean, I think uh, probably to the source of frustration to the film composer, they'll be like, I love this. And then <laughs> right. the film composer's like, oh great, they love yeah. that. <laughs> I'm going to have to do another thing like that again. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, exactly. um, So yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, I'm, you know, not to whatever, uh, blow my own trumpet or whatever, but yeah, I think music is one of definitely one of my strengths. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, kind of creating a kind of a palette for the movie and a kind of a, and a, and a kind of a journey with the music. Um, and, uh, you know, when the director's comfortable with it, you know, I definitely, uh, I definitely kind of like, you know, try to, uh, you know, have a dialogue with the composer, you know, when it actually gets to that point when we got to sort of, you know, get, kick that stuff out and uh, get my tracks out and get their stuff in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Crazy. Okay, so the next one uh, on the list here, you probably can guess, it's it's another huge, huge one. It, it's uh, uh, your first foray into the Marvel Universe before it was owned by Disney. So Deadpool, uh, which all of our uh, younger listeners will probably be like, finally, we're at, we're at, you know, at the, the, the cream of the crop. Um, tell us about uh, your experience getting Deadpool and, and working on it. And, and I think that this is the first real comedic uh, one. So we'll touch on that also. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I had I did other, done other stuff that had been comedic. It's just uh, no one's seen. It's just very few people. Right. Have seen it. <laughs> uh, but uh, but yes, uh, of course. Uh, well, the, so, yeah, the way I got the job. Uh, uh, well, I think it's you know, it's not that exciting a story, but, you know, Tim Miller is uh, this is very L.A. He's uh, he's represented by the same agency as me. Uh, so there was a bit of that going on, you know, where it's like, oh, you know, he needs someone again. First time director doesn't have an editor. So it's kind of like a wide open field. Uh, so I think I was, you know, presented to him by the agents that we had in common uh, or the agency. And uh, and I think the other two things I had going for me was uh, it was filming in Vancouver. And so there was a bunch of Vancouver crew who had kind of worked with me on the Blomkamp stuff. So they were also kind of in my corner. Mm. And then I think the studio was trying to foist some, edit, you know, editor or editors on, 
on Tim Miller that were kind of like, you know, their people. Mm -hmm. And Tim was like, yeah, I don't want to do that. You know, (laughs) I don't want to have an editor on who's like, you know, more, you know, loyal to the studio than they are to me. So again, I think that actually the fact that I was sort of like more of a dark horse in this situation kind of worked in my favor because I wasn't one of these people who kind of was like, well, I've like done 10 movies with Fox and like, you know, I'm, you know, uh, so it was kind of a, a thing where I was a little bit more of an outsider like him. Uh, and so I think those things all kind of work together. Uh, and then, you know, we met and hit it off and, uh, yeah, Tim's awesome. We, uh, we get along really great. Um, so yeah, we've now done, got on to do a whole bunch of stuff together. Right. Um, and then, yeah, in terms of the, the comedy aspect of it and why well, I'd say that, you know, what's sort of interesting about Deadpool in general is like, I think when you watch it, you kind of go, oh yeah, this like really looked like it came together easy and just, it's like a great journey and it's fun or whatever. And you're like, yeah, but it's like, that was not the case at all. Cause there's a lot going on in there, you know, it's, you know, deceptive, uh, it's deceptive, you know, cause there's like this kind of sort of fairly dramatic, serious, like cancer origin story. Right. And there's like a pretty straight up, like romance, like almost rom-com thing going on. Right. Then there's action. And then there's like this kind of comedy, black comedy and kind of like, uh, uh, you know, kind of meta fourth wall breaking stuff. Right. So there's a lot kind of going on there uh, tonally. And so, you know, it was interesting, you know, when we had like the dramatic stuff be a little bit too dark, then you kind of go like, oh, now, now the kind of laughter here kind of dies here. And so you'd have to kind of like, okay, we need to like tone this down a little bit. It's a little too far. And then you'd be like, oh, this area here with the romance, when we have the joke here, now the romance doesn't feel very good. So you got to like take out the joke there or whatever. And so there's this kind of like this delicate tonal balancing act to have all these sort of balls up in the air and have them all kind of feel natural together. Um, So yeah, there was this kind of interesting part, uh, you know, that really crystallized that for me where, you know, we had the torture dungeon and uh, there was, uh, you know, this sort of bit where he gets like basically like impaled on the spike, you know, and then he kind of crawls up from the ashes and like is sort of born Deadpool and it's all like dramatic. And then like right after that, uh, we had this, you know, scene where he like meets uh, Weasel, the you know, the, uh, the, 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 the bartender character and like, you know, has this really funny scene where he's like, making jokes about how he looks like Freddy Krueger and stuff. And like, he gets his name Deadpool. And it was a really funny scene. And like, no one would laugh at it because they were so traumatized by him being impaled. <laughs> right. So it was like, we had to, we did like a reshoot scene there and we like put in the scene where it was like, you know, he's stalking his, his, you know, his girlfriend, but he, but he doesn't have uh, the guts to, to show him, you know, himself to her. And it was this beautiful two birds with one stone thing. Cause it kind of kept the romance story alive and then it gave us this buffer where the audience had time to recover from this impalement scene and then they could laugh at the next scene. Mm-hmm. And so it's just sort of showed you how fragile the sort of tonal shifts in this movie were, you know? Um, so, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was, I learned a hell of a lot doing that one. Yeah. But in it also, I, I would imagine, you know, they always say comedy is about timing and unless you're in a master shot or you're in uh, you know, a, a one or in a scene, you're going to be the one creating the timing. Do you find that that's a key element? Of course. Yeah, of course. Of course. But I mean, uh, Ryan Reynolds also has like impeccable comic timing. So, you know, he's often, you know, already giving you a roadmap to great timing. Um, You know, uh, yeah, he's, you know, incredibly funny and he gave us a lot of alts too. So when something didn't work, you kind of like, oh, let's try this one or whatever. So uh, not to say that it was like easy and that the timing didn't have to be crafted, but you know, he's really, he's really good. And so it's, it's, you know, uh, he definitely makes your life easier than it could be when you're kind of get like, Oh, really hit and miss dailies, you know, right. um, where you need to really kind of like heavily craft it to get a laugh or something like that. You know, he's really the full package. He can do dramatic and funny and, you know, everything in between. Right. So people often say that comedy is more difficult than drama to achieve. Would you agree with that? Or is that overblown? You know, maybe in terms of the technical aspect of executing it, I think it's that the the challenges are different. Like I think the, the technical challenge of crafting stuff to be funny is, uh, is hard the way like cutting action is hard, you know? 
Uh, but you know when it works, right? You screen it for an audience, they laugh. If they don't laugh, try something else, right? That's very binary. And like, that's a lot in drama. You don't, you don't know, right? Are they staring intentively enjoying it or are they staring intentively hating it, right? You just have to take their word when they fill out the sheet, how they feel afterwards. But you don't get that like, that completely binary, like yes or no, like that worked or didn't work, right? And I also think with, with drama, like um, it's uh, it doesn't have this thing where, you know, with comedy, it's like you have laughs and horror, you have scares in action. You have excitement. There's these sort of things that are just like uh, visceral experiences from the audience. They like, right. Drama doesn't have that. You're purely surviving on is your writing and acting and like, are your scenes awesome? Do they love this story? Like, is it so moving or so interesting or so clever? So it's like drama, it has to be exceptional or it's terrible, right? Because otherwise people don't want to watch it, right? Mm -hmm. You can make like a, you know, if your comedy has laughs, but it's otherwise pretty banal, like people will still watch it, right? Mm -hmm. People won't watch like a banal drama, right? Like it has to be excellent. So I think that's, I think maybe like the, the challenge of drama is like, there's no room for any form of mediocrity. It's like, it's excellent or nothing. Right. <laughs> right. Well, that's a perfect segue to the next one, which is a little more dramatic. Uh, Handmaid's Tale, which is sort of the first, this, the streaming one, uh, Hulu's uh, biggest hit of all time. Uh, also based on Margaret Atwood and other Canadians novel, Ryan Reynolds, Canadian, you're keeping it in the family. <laughs> Kudos to you, Jules. Yep, that, um, one, that one is shot in Toronto too. So that was yeah. a Canadian production. That's right. So uh, tell us about that a little bit. How was it to go to a streaming uh, service instead of a movie? Was there a big change? Um, well, I mean, I think the big change with me was just like, it's, you know, whatever you call it, streaming or not streaming, it was television versus doing a feature, right? So, so it's like uh, this much shorter period of time, you have to work on it, you know, whatever it is, six, eight weeks, eight weeks, versus like working on something for like 10 months or a year or something like that. Is that because uh, you like did certain episodes as opposed to an entire season? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's usually like, you know, probably like three editors or something on like a, or four on like a season of television, right? So like usually an editor won't do more than like three episodes or something like that. And in this case, I just did the pilot episode. Um, I was kind of like in a holding pattern, uh, you know, <laughs> waiting for various feature things to happen. So I was kind of like looking for work. And then I was like read The Handmaid's Tale script and I was like, oh my God, this thing's like, it's like a gut punch, you know, it was just really like, dramatic. Uh, it was just really dramatic and intense. And, you know, it's still science fiction in a way. Uh, but I loved that, if, that it was like, you know, no robots and explosions. And it was, it's almost like a parlor drama, you know, where it's about like looks and what's not being said. Mm -hmm. And so it was like this, it was just like exercise this entire different muscle from like this sort of, robots and explosions kind of muscles that I've been exercising a lot uh, on other projects. So, uh, so yeah, I was really excited to do it. And Reed Morano, the director on that, she's really talented and uh, she's used to be a DOP. And so she just captures really beautiful images too. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so yeah, I was really, I was really uh, happy to work on something of that quality that was totally different from the other stuff I'd worked on. Yeah. Um, one little cool thing to kind of just mention uh, you know, about sort of editing this, the Handmaid's Tale stuff is the sort of Elizabeth Moss dailies. I, you know, uh, she uh, is really impressive. You know, we had these, we had these scenes, you know, where, you know, there's a bunch of voiceover in the show, you know, where, you know, you're hearing her internal monologue and uh, they had pre-recorded those, you know, before I think they'd started shooting the episode. And I swear to God, in the scenes where those VOs were, she had memorized the cadences of them. And you can see her thinking the VO. Wow. Like, so you'd hit certain words and then her eyes would do something. And you'd be like, oh my God. <laughs> wow. Like, so, so she, yeah. So I was just like, this is some like next level acting going on here. Wow. Yeah. She's, she's really cool. The interesting thing about that is that the book is actually like a satire, right? Like it was actually like an embellished, it, it, it sort of took a kernel of the problem with, uh, you know, feminism and stuff in the eighties. And then it kind of satirized a world where that came true to its most horrible uh, form. And then, but it was, I guess, was it always a choice tonally to remove 
the satire from the show and, and make it straight drama. Cause I feel like that, that, that is not a part of, <laughs> there's no like dark humor about the show unless maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I, you know, I think, I think, I think there is, there's a still, uh, you know, I think it's very subtle though. There is a sardonic quality to the voiceover, like a slight rebelliousness to the voiceover that offers some kind of, you know, uh, you know, not, you know, uh, you know, black humor commenting on her situation, mm -hmm. which just makes it a little bit more palatable. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, some, you know, I think in the episode I did, even in the, you know, where they go in and they're like, uh, you know, shopping for like fruit in the grocery store. And there's something a little bit kind of almost like, Stepford wives about it or something like that, you know, so I think there's still a, like a little undercurrent of that, but you know, uh, not much, just enough to help, I think, to help make it, you know, not, you know, and I think maybe they, as the show went on, they kind of doubled down on the sort of, on the bleak dramatic qualities of it or whatever, for sure. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I know satire is like a kind of volume knob, you know, it's like, uh, so, you know, we had a little just turned out just a tad. And then it's like, you know, it's a tad more in Elysium. And then it's like cranked up to max on like Chappie. <laughs> right. uh, so, you know, uh, it's and, you know, it's sort of a, that's just kind of a, a, a tool you have to play with, I guess. Yeah. Right, right, right. All right. So then we, we go into your first foray into animation. Uh, you've got, I don't know, David Fincher may be involved, Love, Death and Robots. I think Tim Miller also involved. So uh, how is it to do animation? Is that a completely different thing? Because that's like it's like all previs or, or what or how does the process work? Yeah, I mean, it's it's very different. It's cool. It's a totally different role editing uh, that kind of work. So it's much more like. Uh, editing that is much more like essentially being involved in the production process as opposed to post-production, you know, where it's like they shoot and then I have a lot of stuff they shot and I put it together. This is more like, you know, I start off on those animated things like editing, editing storyboards with, you know, with, with the kind of voice tracks. And then we're kind of like, Oh, you know, maybe we want like a different board here. Like maybe we should have this angle or maybe we want this board here or maybe we should rewrite the video here. So you're kind of involved in sort of shaping what it is you're going to shoot, if mm -hmm. you understand what I mean, mm -hmm. right? Because the sort of making of the shots is essentially the shooting process, right? Mm -hmm. And then we got to get into the making of it. And then, you know, you're kind of like, you know, those shots have handles and stuff. And sometimes they do alt camera angles and you're sort of figuring out which ones you want to use. And then still maybe you're kind of learning like in the boarding process, oh, maybe we need a shot that does this, or maybe we need a shot that does that. And so you're kind of involved in this sort of, in the discussion of this sort of shot creation process. And so you have a lot less to edit, but you're kind of like a part of one of the voices of like deciding what gets animated, you know? Um, so, uh, yeah, it's neat. It's a neat kind of different way of doing things. Crazy. And then is that, obviously that process takes longer because, you know, a Pixar movie take, they do it for like four years and they recut it and reanimate it. Did you, are, did you find that more, uh, time consuming than Handmaid's Tale? It must be. Uh, well, you know, I mean, I think, you know, there comes a point where it's like, okay, you guys probably don't need me now. <laughs> uh, good luck with the lighting of the shots. Right. So there's, you know, when it kind of gets into like the extreme, you know, the sort of, uh, the, uh, really just executing the, the sort of final versions of that stuff. I, you know, I was sort of, uh, off payroll at that point, you know? Um, so I was kind of more, you know, about the kind of getting it, you know, it pointed in that direction of what they're going to final. And then once they're finaling, you know, then I was kind of like less needed on a, you know, a feature than probably your, you keep doing it, but these are shorts. Um, and, you know, because they're shorts, it's not taking the sort of two year, two year Pixar length, but, but yeah, it's still a pretty glacial process. You know, it doesn't go fast for sure. But I mean, that's kind of also the kind of cool part of it, because you can just totally like a kind of obsess, you know, on this sort of micro detail, the way you do in visual effects, where you're like, let's do this, let's do this, let's make the camera do this, whatever. And so you can kind of just really like get into the nitty gritty on stuff forever, you know. Uh, so if you have that sort of obsession with detail, then it can be kind of fun, you know, kind of like putting all this stuff under the microscope and taking a long time with it. 
Got it. Got it. Crazy. Um, all right. So then, uh, the last, last big sci-fi one, uh, that I will, uh, steal you for here, Terminator Dark Fate. Oh, going straight to the top of the list here. That's pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, so, you know, we've covered Terminator 2. It's like, you know, cyberpunk genre, a uh, huge, uh, franchise, um, what was that like? You had more cooks in the kitchen, I believe, right? Because James Cameron is an executive producer and the creator, but he's not the director. How does that? Yeah, happen? yeah. I mean, actually, like a lot of you know, a lot of cooks we had because it also had three studios. Right, it had Skydance, Fox, and Paramount as studios. James Cameron as a producer, uh, and yeah, you know, my first, you know, two hundred million plus budget movie I've worked on. So yeah, so it was like it was very intense. Uh, process, uh, to say the least, uh, you know, and of course, you know, there was like, you know, not, there was definitely, you know, disagreements about things. And then you'd have to kind of like sort of sort through the correct way to kind of navigate through these different, uh, political waters. Uh, so yeah, that, that one was, uh, that one was a doozy for sure. <laughs> right. And it's also rebooting a major franchise with like timelines. And I mean, did you, were you involved in all the discussions of how are we going to make this make sense? Cause you're basically going back in time and going on a different sort of parallel universe, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't, you know, there was a whole, I think writer's room uh, that, you know, Tim and James Cameron were involved in. They kind of arrived at that as the solution and, you know, uh, you know, I would have been happily to sit in on some of that, but I was not involved in that part of the process. And so, yeah, I think they they kind of arrived at the, uh, uh, you know, conclusion that like since they basically wanted to retcon from Terminal Terminator 3 on that, like the way to, you know, that the way to do this was this sort of like alternate timeline idea where, you know, that Terminator 2 had stopped Skynet and that that this sort of... Uh, uh, other AI enemy legion came came into existence, and you know I think some people were put off by this. Uh, I felt like there was a cool idea there that maybe we didn't fully articulate clearly enough. You know, which is this idea that like the war with AI is like, inevitable, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like nuclear weapons or something. Like if uh, if uh, America hadn't created it, then someone else would have created it, right? That there's this sort of thing. Eventually, we're going to create this AI. And this AI is going to like not want uh, to be uh, be under our control, and then there's going to be like a conflict. And so there was a kind of a neat idea of, uh, out there of the inevitability of this, mm. but it didn't. We that was all kind of implicit. Uh, you know, we did it didn't kind of get directly articulated, which maybe you know maybe that would have been better to do that to sort of directly state that. Um, but uh, but yeah, you know, and I think uh, I think the audience had been through so many Terminator movies that they had been let down by mm -hmm. that. It was sort of like they were uh, tough customers, you know, <laughs> like it was, it was pretty, pretty hard to make something that was going to please them because they were, they had been kind of, you know, pretty uh, jaded, you know, fairly jaded based on what had come before. Uh, so, uh, so yes. Yeah, so they let our, you know, so a lot of the audience let us know their displeasure with, various things we did, which were not, you know, done for cynical reasons or anything, you know, right. uh, another one was, I think that, you know, that we were trying to do some sort of social justice warrior thing with making John Connor, uh, you know, be, uh, a woman, Danny this time. And, you know, I, I don't think there was any kind of agenda there other than like, well, since we're retconning this, like why repeat ourselves, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, it's not like strong women characters are not part of the DNA of, right of the series. So, so yeah, anyway, so I, there was definitely kind of a, a complicated fan reaction to a bunch of those choices. Uh, but, uh, you know, that was, uh, that's just how that, that path, how all went down. Yeah. Well, everyone has, it's, it, it's, it's so difficult, right? Cause everyone has these, there's memories almost of childhood and all this nostalgia and, and you're into tamper with that is, is like, it's like the, the new star Wars trilogy has shown. It's like, it's really, you know, dangerous territory. And it's, and you're right. The, the, it's like maybe an impossible task, who knows, but. Um, yeah. That's kind of what I arrived at where I was like, Oh, maybe there's like, not like a, a way to do this that would like, you know, based on that set of circumstances you know not to say that there's not like flaws or something in the movie like there's sure there's flaws or whatever um but uh yeah and it's and it's interesting talking about the star wars movies you know like 
that the new Star Wars movies gave me an appreciation for the much hated prequels. Right, 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 right. right. Like the prequels, I mean, they have the embarrassing I hate sand dialogue and like some like really terrible stuff in them. But what they don't do is just completely retread this territory you've already been in. Right. Where there's something where you're like, uh, when you get to the sort of second and third movie of the sort of new trilogy, you're like, oh, my God, this is feeling like tired, you know. And uh, that was what was so cool about the Mandalorian, I think, was that like by freeing themselves from this like new savior of the universe narrative, you're like, oh, my God, now Star Wars is cool again. Right. Right. Like uh, so, yeah, the movies could definitely learn something from that where it's just like. Let's not just like keep doing this whole like hero savior myth thing, you know, over and over again, where the stakes are always save the universe. Like maybe these more smaller, more contained, less predictable stories are kind of the better untapped area to kind of like dive into. Right, right, right. Um, Okay, so you have an extra hundred million on this movie. Does that add anything to your process? You get all the bells and whistles and all the fun toys, or it just adds more cooks in the kitchen. <laughs> How does that work? I mean, I think, I mean, I, I, I mean, I guess, uh, I think probably both. Right. I mean, I think on the one hand, you know, there's not people saying like, Oh, you can't make that be a visual effect. We can't afford that or whatever. Right. Like you have the resources to do all that stuff. Um, um, but in some cases, it's like, you know, maybe should you do it or whatever, right? Or, you know, in other cases, like, oh, well, you know, like, there's a lot of stuff, you know, uh, where I kind of, you know, wish we had an opportunity to shoot some stuff like more, you know, practically in the third act, but it just wasn't possible or whatever, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we did a lot of stuff with CG there. And I'm much bigger fan of the kind of stuff in the first act with like the, with the uh, practical effects and the car chase and stuff like that. Uh, that's much more my, my vibe. Right. Um, and, but you know, the, what, what comes also with that $200 million budget is this like pressure to like, it must make money. It must be, you know, liked by everyone. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's a, I, I, you know, and I've kind of purposely, you know, avoided often kind of doing movies at this kind of budget level for exactly that reason. Like, you know, I think movies like, like Deadpool and district nine couldn't exist at those budget levels. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because there would be this pressure for them to be kind of liked by everyone. And so they couldn't be R rated in that sort of way that like, I mean, Terminator actually dark fate is R rated, but it doesn't have that kind of sense where it's kind of pushing the envelope, you know, like Deadpool has a lot of edgy humor or district nine. The protagonist is like, you know, pretty unlikable in a way. Like he's charismatic. He makes Charlton makes it work, but it's like a risk that like, that someone in a $200 million movie would like, they would never let you make those risks. Right. right? So, uh, so yeah, there's a kind of like a limitation there of what you can kind of do in that, even though you have all these resources, there's this sort of like box that you kind of get like a little bit put into, I think, or the box at least exists in your head where you feel this pressure for like, everyone needs to like it. I can't be too weird. I can't be too extreme. I can't like take too many risks or whatever. Right. And I think that, you know, not just with editing, but that like, I think applies like everywhere out into the filmmaking process, you know? Right. right. So you went from the underground indie guy in Vancouver up through to the, to being at the center of the bullseye of four studios and like major personalities and egos. So, uh, you know, it sounds like maybe somewhere in the middle is the happy zone. I don't know. <laughs> Yes, yes, the happy zone is definitely in the middle for me. Though, though, you know, those movies are getting made less and less now, right? Mm-hmm. At least by the Hollywood places, you know. I think those movies are still kind of existing in places like, you know, Netflix and stuff like that. Um, so, um, you know, maybe that's more of the world I have to move into. Um, but yeah, that kind of mid-budget kind of movie that takes risks, like that's not really the model, you know, that's sort of prevalent now in Hollywood, right? You know, it's like Fox is gone or Paramount's sort of pivoting to being more streaming focused and like, you know, kind of, you know, last men standing or like, you know, universal and Disney and Warner brothers. And they're all kind of very focused on these kind of like tentpole movies, you know, the $200 million movies or whatever. Right. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, so there's a kind of, uh, now kind of Netflix and Amazon are a little bit moving to fill that kind of gap and make these sort of more kind of, 
uh, you know, weirder, more adult oriented kind of genre movies, but they're still kind of in their infancy. So it doesn't really feel like, you know, it's this robust golden age of that stuff, stuff happening, you know, right now. But I hope, yeah, I hope I'm keep, hope keeping the dream alive. Cause yeah, that's kind of still where I feel like the most exciting work happens kind of in that, in, at least in Hollywood, you know, in that kind of mid budget range. Right. Yeah. And I guess that leads to your, your, the movie you've got coming out very soon, like Friday, maybe Thursday is, um, uh, yeah, well, there, it gets kind of a theatrical release before that for a little, for a little, 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 little tiny theatrical release. And then, yeah. And then it's on Netflix on November, on November 12th. Got it. So that is of course, red notice. And so you are, so Netflix was the studio. And yes. It's sort of that mid range is it, would you, it's not exactly your sci-fi. So you're sort of, you do have films that aren't sci-fi. Of course, I focused more on that, but it's the metaverse, your metaverse narrative better to talk about science fiction. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, but so Red Notice is is sort of a, a spy comedy thriller kind of action adventure. Uh, yeah, yeah, kind of, I guess I kind of, yeah, it's sort of, you know, uh, yeah, action comedy. Right. It's, you know, a, you know, a little bit in the sort of, you know, Ocean's Eleven, uh, Man from Nuncle, you know, kind of capery, you know, capery, fun, light comedy, uh, action, globe trotting kind of thing. Uh, yeah. And it's like, it's super fun. It was a, it's kind of a perfect thing to work on during like a depressing pandemic. Yeah. You know? so it's right. like this very like, like, you know, light, fun, very easy to like movie. Um, and, you know, you know, if this movie was coming from like, you know, a place like Universal or something like that, you can like, oh, yeah, that's sort of like a kind of thing you'd sort of expect, like, you know, one of those, you know, studios to release in the summer or something like that. But like coming from Netflix, I kind of feel like this still kind of sticks out, I think, as far as kind of like a Netflix release is in terms of like, if you think of the things that have been kind of like big Netflix movies, like Extraction and stuff like that, they are kind of like those kind of like uh mid budget not four quadrant kind of movies you know yeah. like like extractions kind of a little bit like you know sort of like a lesser men on fire or something like that right mm -hmm. and so they haven't really you know made one of those kind of like big splashy fun summer movie kind of things i think six underground was maybe supposed to be that but didn't really be, it didn't really pull it off mm -hmm. uh, so hopefully maybe we've done that with this one you know mm -hmm. oh well, I'll have to get everyone to check it out. Um, all right. So here I'm putting you on the spot. What is the favorite movie that you've worked on? The favorite one that I've worked on? Yes. Your favorite child. Which one is it? <laughs> in terms of the end product or the process of making it? In terms it? of you're a film fan, you're going to see it in a theater and you love it. Oh, well, I, I think I think I have to go with District 9 just because of like how, I, I you know, like, like Deadpool's, Deadpool's awesome. And it's an awesome sort of like, you know, sly take on the superhero genre. But I feel like District 9 is sort of just sort of like the most out of the box one where it's not like, uh, it's like kind of like, I don't, I don't know if I quite, you know, it's not in quite in a genre of itself, but it's in that direction where it's like this found footage, mockumentary, South African action, sci-fi, social, there's just a lot of stuff going on there there's not a lot of other stuff out there that is kind of like it, you know? And then even afterwards, you know, uh, there's not been that much else like it. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I guess in terms of just the sort of uniqueness of that one, there's a kind of coolness to how unique that is. It's crazy that we got to make that at all, you know? Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. I think, I think that my personal favorite would be district nine also. Uh, so, you know, you, you, you're right, Joe, you keep, you peaked back in uh, 2005. I'm okay with that. You know, I mean, like my goal was never to be like the biggest editor in the world or anything. I just want to watch, watch, you know, work on cool stuff that I'd like to watch and hopefully other people want to watch it as well and, uh, you know, make a living at it. So, uh, I'm, I'm very happy with, uh, with, uh, how things are going. Absolutely. You know, it's like I, when I was like thinking about what we were talking about today and looking back at movies, I was like, wow, what a resume. That is like freaking awesome. I'm like, these are so impressive and such a cool, uh, you know, pastiche of sci-fi. And then there's so many others that we didn't even talk about. Like even there's, uh, you know, you worked on Al Altered Carbon and then there's like Almanac and then there's like, I don't know, there's, there's just like so many to, to talk about. Um, Oh, by the, so Alter Carbon, did you do the pilot on that or was that you just did some episodes on that? 
I didn't do the I didn't do the pilot on that one. I right. think I was doing. I think I might have been working on Handman's Tale when the pilot was getting happening. Oh, yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. We'll save that one for for another day. All right. So, <laughs> so, um, all right. So, so, what's next for you, Jules? What are you? Uh, what I'm are you trying. Yeah, I'm trying to figure that out now. I mean, I just finished Red Notice like uh, about two weeks ago. Right. Um, so you know, uh, now I'm like trying to figure out uh, what's next for me. Um, I'm, you know, there's a sort of possible, uh, you know, uh, project for me in the summer. So I'm like trying to keep things open. It's a real pain in the, you know, it's a real pain when you have these possible projects and then you're kind of like, so now I have to find something like short to not conflict with that. And then, you know, it's going to push and then you'd be like, I could have taken a longer project, but that's how whatever life goes with you're trying to like block out these periods of time. Editing just takes a long time on these movies. So when you're, uh, uh, you know, when someone has something for you and then you're like, okay. And like, you know, it's six months from now you're like, Oh, it's going to push. I know, but I'm going to try to take something in case it doesn't push anyway. So that's the situation, which situation I'm in right now. Um, well, you're deserving some much needed downtime. I'm sure. Hope you get to enjoy your life outside of an editing room. Um, if people wanted to reach out to you, uh, maybe start a, a, a fan, a fan club or a, a DAO that is in your name. Uh, how could people get in touch with you? Are you just hiding away in your editing, uh, dark room? Uh, yeah. How, how can they get in touch with me? I mean, I guess email, I think they can probably still look me up on the UBC website. I think my email <laughs> there <you go. laughs> UBC film program alumni website. That's how. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> There you go, guys. Anyone going to UBC? As a matter of fact, you know, the weird coincidence is our next, my guest next week is also from UBC. Completely weird uh, coincidence. And UBC, of course, for those listening, is the University of British Columbia. It's the uh, school in Vancouver, which I don't even think they have, they do films anymore, right? They, talking about did, it. did they not, did the film, is the film department still exist? Well, there was a time when it was kind of like having, you know, financial troubles and then there was a big fundraiser. So I presume like we, we, we kept it alive. No, it's alive, man. You're, you're, you're just out of the loop. <laughs> I am definitely out of the loop. I'm pretty sure it's alive. Uh, <laughs> well, in the EI2 dimension, it's definitely not alive. <laughs> I, I keep getting confused with the timeline and dimensions and all that stuff. Um, anyway, Jules, it was, it was great hanging out. Uh, I'm glad we could do this and talk about this insanely epic career you've had. Uh, so impressive. So thanks so much for coming on. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. Next time we can, we'll try to get it working in, in, in virtual reality next time. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, all right. Well, thank you for teleporting into this world cast of simulation nation, whether you're with us in virtual reality, not today, listening to the podcast and Spotify or Apple podcasts and watching or watching in glorious technicolor on YouTube, where I will put, uh, the slides of the different movies we talked about, but of course we won't have, uh, the usual visuals and remember to subscribe to our Instagram at the simulation nation. Twitter at SimNationVR, Facebook and Discord. And uh, join us next time for our 10th episode in our World Builders of Alt Space series with Splash Mango, also from UBC, also from Vancouver. She's an incredible um, virtual artist, digital artist. Uh, she uses uh, Tilt Brush to create these 3D environments that you can fly through and all this stuff. It's really cool stuff. So until then, stay plugged, my friends.